I'm going to be talking a little bit today about a subject that uh, tends to be quite controversial in some circles and that. If we take a look at alien invasive species control over the years, plants have been very well covered. They um, have received a lot of publicity over the last decade or more. And when it comes to invasive animals, there's not much uh, known in the public uh, domain about invasive animals. In actual fact, a lot of people are quite surprised to hear that we do have invasive animals and that these invasive animals are causing problems. Now, I'm going to be talking a little bit about removing invasive animals, um, showing you some recent case studies here in South Africa, and the importance of correct communication, um, which is quite important when you are going out and eliminating crows and mallards and cute, fluffy, furry things, which um, some people object to um, the removal of that. So, All right. Um, invasive animal control, it obviously has a unique set of challenges. Um, you've got to take into consideration issues around public perception. Uh, cultural sensitivities need to be addressed. Animal welfare must be taken into consideration as well. Gone are the days where you could just take a shotgun, walk out into the local wetland and start shooting away. There are a lot of people that feed the ducks, who bring their children to feed the ducks, and who appreciate the ducks. So going and um, unleashing a barrage of violence on them is not a good idea. Um, you've got to bear in mind as well, in the last decade, we've got social media, Facebook, Twitter, Whatever you do out there is going to be reported and it's going to fly around the globe rapidly. And you're going to have journalists at your doorstep asking what on earth were you doing. So these things need to be uh, thought out carefully. Um, stakeholder and partnership engagement is essential as well. Um, before you plan any removal or control program um, of an animal, you need to get together with the various stakeholders and the partners and you need to work through this. You've got to uh, think about it quite carefully. A professional communication campaign must be rolled out well in advance of any planned invasive animal removal project. Uh, a lot of you will recall the removal of the Himalayan tiles on Table Mountain many years back. Um, it caused an absolute outrage. People didn't understand why they needed to be removed. A lot of people actually thought they were part and parcel of Table Mountain, um, not realizing the incredible damage that these animals were doing to the unique Fainbos biome. And um, a lot of that can be avoided if you plan ahead and you start rolling out a communications campaign well in advance. Start educating the public about what these invasive species are doing. That way, when it comes to control, it's going to be a lot easier at the time. All the different species require a different approach to communications because of the different levels of how people feel about those animals. You can go out into the supermarket and you can buy rat ticks, you can buy mouse traps and rat traps and you can set them wherever you want. You can't go out to the supermarket and get a mallard trap or something that's going to capture a mallard ducks um, because most people don't appreciate rats and mice around their, their home. Uh, they have a long history of uh, spreading various pathogens and also to they well known to be quite destructive. So the people's perception regarding rodents is different to what they may be regarding Himalayan tars on Table Mountain. Um, house crows are associated with witchcraft and disease and therefore they don't receive as much a affection as would your mallard ducks. Mallard ducks are considered cute and cuddly and looked upon as being the friendly uh, uh, duck at children can feed at the local pond and um, probably associated with Walt Disney's Donald Duck as well. There is a very large angling fraternity passionate about bass and trout fishing and there is a substantial fly fishing industry behind that as well. So when you start talking about removing and controlling uh, bass and particularly trout, um, in a way I'm relieved that Dr. Preston has left because the moment you mention the word trout, um, he gets quite excited. You saw how quickly he went through his trout images earlier. Um, so you've got to take these things into consideration and each group um, will require a different strategy to put forward in order to address those. I'm just going to briefly go over some of the, the, the things that we have learned and I must um, tell you that from a, commu a communications point of view, we're also learning as we go along. We've had a long association with invasive plants, but working with invasive animals is 
completely new to us. So we do make mistakes along the way and we learn from those mistakes and we move forward. Um, I'm just going to mention a few projects over here. Bass removal from the Rondekat River, the Mallow Duck Euthanasia conducted at Century City in Cape Town, house crow removal project and a three-year guttural toad removal project in uh, Constantia. Um, bass removal from the Rondekat River in the Western Cape. Um, it's home to five native fish species, some of which are endangered. I think in actual fact one or two of them are probably critically endangered. And there were surveys conducted in 2003 and 2011, which showed that there was a four kilometer stretch of the river, the lower part, um, invaded by smallmouth bass. Uh, Cape Nature embarked on an eradication uh, project followed by a comprehensive environmental impact assessment. So they went in, they took a look that a lot of the indigenous species had already been eliminated by the bass, they had been eaten up. Um, so on the 29th of February, 2012, the piscicide rotulin was applied to the stream. Now you've got to bear in mind that this can be quite controversial because you're going into a wilderness area, you're throwing in a poison into the water that's not selective. It's not like biocontrol that's going to go out um, and target a specific plant. Um, the piscicide is non-selective. It wipes out all your fish. But through the survey and the environmental impact assessment, they saw that a lot of the indigenous fish were already gone from that system. Um, and they were worried about these bats potentially spreading further. So they applied the rotenone, and um, that obviously uh, received a lot of media attention in that, and it was important to manage it very carefully, which I think Cape Nature did a sterling job. They put articles in all the applicable magazines, um, such as Farmers Weekly, your fly fishing magazine, and a couple of other media outlets explaining exactly what they were doing and the reason behind this. And um, you can see that it still caused a bit of controversy, but um, it went down reasonably well in the long term. And as an afterthought, they also using social media very well, such as um, Facebook and the video channels like YouTube and Vimeo, to actually show the results of that treatment. And um, you can actually go on to, to Vimeo where they've got this Rondekat River restoration project and it actually shows the recovery, how many fish have come back into that system, indigenous fish. So a highly successful project and again really good publicity around this has allowed these projects to actually expand. Mallard ducks is a lot more of a problem. Uh, the city of Cape Town tried to fly a little bit under the radar, they didn't want to garnish too much attention around the killing of ducks. Um, and unfortunately there were a couple of groups that did get wind of this and in some areas it caused an absolute sensational stir. Again through social media there were protesters that went out with their placards and started protesting and saying don't kill the ducks, started marching and surrounding and protecting um, these areas where the invasive mallards occur. As you know mallards are category 1b uh, which means that they do need to be controlled and um, so it obviously caused the problem at the time. Bearing in mind this was before the NEMBA invasive alien species regulations were officially gazetted. So there was also not the backing of official legislation which made things even more complicated as well. However, further stakeholder engagement and strategic communications has been critical in working with residents at Century City. This is one of the areas where they have successfully removed mallards. And it is done in a very humane manner. They don't just go out with a shotgun. Uh, the NSBC is involved. There's an environmental uh, consultancy involved as well. And effectively what they do is they go out very early in the morning. They put out bread for these ducks. Uh, there's also indigenous ducks and swans and other uh, bird life around there. And what happens is that there's a sleeping drug in the bread. And all the ducks basically eat the bread. They all go to sleep. The only difference is that the mallards don't wake up again. Um, but that is conducted very, very carefully with um, animal welfare groups like the NSPCA to ensure that it is done humanely and um, done properly. But um, if you don't communicate properly, it will get into the papers. There's always somebody walking the dog. There's always somebody watching you. So you've got to think about these things carefully. Right, and as you can see, um, mallard ducks have yellow bills and yellow feet, and so does Donald Duck. So there's a long history of this association with the mallard duck, 
making them very cute, unlike your your house crows. What we've done as well over the last couple of years is we've put in quite a lot of different um, uh, information brochures out into the public to start telling people about the potential and the, the destruction that these invasive species cause. And uh, this is an identification kit that was put out for mallards to start showing the differences over there. There was also a Z-fold produced. And a couple of signboards as well. Um, you need to kind of tell people that these are a threat to our indigenous waterfowl. We know that mallard do hybridize with yellow-billed ducks, black ducks, um, the cage shovelers. So it's important to, to put out a message out there, save our indigenous waterfowl from the mallards. As cute as they are, they are genetically contaminating our local bird life, and that is why we are implementing these control measures. Right, the house curve project has also been a, a, a pretty good success. Uh, Dr. Guy Preston elaborated on a little bit earlier that we've almost got to the point where we think we may achieve eradication with that, but um, there's always those ones coming down from further up in uh, on, on the East Coast. Um, but there's also, again, the public perception around house crows has been completely different because they, as I said earlier, they are often associated with witchcraft and, um, you know, not, not as cute and as cuddly and as accessible as your mallard ducks are. So they were a lot easier to deal with and Durban uh, and also Cape Town have run very successful control programs with the house crows. And there's also been quite a, pub a bit of... Uh, Publicity and education material has gone out. Guttural toads in Constantia, this has also taken a different media approach. Um, it's one of those where we have not um, publicized it too much because it is pretty much locally uh, contained to the suburb of Constantia. And the reason being is that the guttural toads can be easily misidentified for the indigenous or the endangered western uh, leopard toad, which is the one that occurs in Cape Town, and the guttural toads are invading in certain areas and they are a direct threat to the western leopard toad. So communications have deliberately been kept low key um, as there's concerns that large scale media could lead to the indiscriminate killing of the endangered leopard toads because for a lot of people they won't be able to differentiate the, 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 the two. Um, so as you can see, each group requires a different set of um, or different idea. Right, that's just a guttural toad. Right, now uh, to, to basically conclude, going forward, until recently we never had the backing of legislation behind invasive animal control. And that was a big stumbling block because whenever anybody questioned you as to what the intention was, you couldn't say by law we need to remove this animal because we didn't have that law. Um, whereas now in NEMBA, um, as of the 1st of October when it effectively became law, we now have the backing of the law and we are starting to get the science and the motivation behind why we need to control certain animals. Um, but despite the legislation, there are still challenges ahead dealing effectively with the trout industry and the exotic pet trade. Those are the two that um, we still need to, to, to work quite a bit with. Um, as I mentioned, um, Trout, bass, and fly fishing, it is um, in certain areas of South Africa. It is very important economically to certain uh, communities. And um, places like Dahlstrom thrive on the trout industry. And there's been a lot of confusion re regarding the, the regulations. So much so that they were actually removed off the invasive species list uh, provisionally until further work and collaboration can be done with the various stakeholders in finding common ground around the issue of trout. Um, a carefully thought through communications campaign is essential to avoid confusion and misinterpretation of the legislation. There was so much confusion around that. The initial idea from the trout industry was that we were out to simply destroy the industry and remove all trout, which was not the intention. We just don't want these trout to get into pristine areas where we've got critically endangered fish, indigenous fish, and lose our indigenous species because of an invasive species. Uh, but um, I've just got a very small selection. Uh, there were hundreds of newspaper and magazine articles, not to mention the social media, 
um, huge amounts of publicity around the trout. Uh, there was also some rebuttals coming in from the, the various invasive species scientists as well, basically trying to explain why the legislation was necessary. Right, and then my particular interest, the exotic pet trade as well. In, in the last decade or two, uh, the diversity of exotic species um, in both fish, birds and reptiles has increased substantially. And some of these are known to be invasive. If you take a look at the state of Florida in the United States, where we've got um, exotic Burmese pythons, which are causing havoc in the Everglades, we have a similar situation that could potentially develop in South Africa because of our unique ecosystems and the amount of invasive uh, or, or exotic reptiles in the trade which could potentially become invasive. Um, intensive stakeholder engagement has ensured a working relationship with the exo exotic pet trade. There are, however, contentious species in the exotic pet trade which will require communications and advocacy to try and educate the public as to the responsibilities. Now, we are working um, very closely with the South African Pet Traders Association. They are being very responsible. Um, and assisting government in uh, finding common ground and also to putting out that um, message out there of responsibility and that. But we do have a few problem species, uh, one of them being the Reliot Slider, which particularly in the province of KwaZulu-Natal right here, um, has been very popular in the pet trade over the last couple of years. It is now listed as a Category 1B species, which means that nobody may keep, trade, breed, sell, or do anything with these uh, uh, radiant sliders. Um, it is listed as one of the top 100 invasive species in the world, So, and um, our climate down here is, is quite suitable for them. Now, we are busy drafting a strategy on how to deal with these species in the trade. How do we get them out of the trade? What do people do? We are very concerned that they are now listed as a Category 1B. People might panic and release them into the wetland system. Uh, we don't know how many there are in the province. There could be uh, several hundred. There may be well over a thousand. We just don't know at the moment. So we're trying to get that information through. But it's one of those species that we are working closely with the pet trade to make sure that they don't become uh, another one of our invasive species that we need to deal with. As a result, we're also uh, uh, starting to produce material which is currently being distributed throughout the pet shops and um, also informing people about the potential hazards around buying one of these invasive exotics. Last year at this conference, I also uh, presented a poster where we were creating a bit of publicity around uh, this species as well as the Burmese python. And another one that we need to very seriously look at is how we deal with the issue of rosewing parakeets. It was also um, introduced via the pet trade. Um, a couple of individuals escaping from aviaries or deliberate release, we don't quite know. But both in the Durban area and also to in Johannesburg and Pretoria, there are feral populations of rosewing parakeets. And we need to um, develop a strategy on how to deal with them. Now, unlike the red head slider, the rosewing parakeet is a listed member category 2 species, which means that people may still keep them, but only under permit, um, so that we can start gaining a bit of control around this particular bird. Right, communicating to the exotic pet keepers and the public, um, there's a lot of ignorance surrounding the exotic pet trade, with many people not aware of the threat posed by certain exotic species, should they escape or be released. Um, public education surrounding problems of exotic animals escaping or being released is absolutely critical. So we are currently rolling out quite a massive communications campaign working with the pet industry as to how to deal with potentially invasive species and teaching people that when you buy a fish or a bird from the pet shop and you get tired of it, you can't just go and release it and let it go into the local wetland. Right. Um, to conclude, uh, a lot of the communications that we're currently doing is through our website, um, www.invasives.org.za. We have got a huge amount of resources on that website as well, so if you are looking for any information on invasive species, please go on to that. And um, as uh, we've mentioned earlier in a couple of the previous presentations as well, 
Um, coll collaborations and partnerships with various um, uh, uh, stakeholders is absolutely essential. And I'd like to acknowledge all the different stakeholders um, and, and partners that we work with, as well as um, particularly Zimbelo KZN Wildlife. Thank you.